Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm Susan Evans McClure. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Arts Council. The Vermont Arts Council recognizes that we gather here in Indakana, the traditional and unsurrendered homeland of the Abenaki people. Please join us in acknowledging their history and their ancestors, their enduring presence, and their future generations. So a little bit of housekeeping before we get into our advocacy work today. We are recording today's program and it will be posted on our website later. The event is also being live captioned by White Coat Captioning. So to view the captions, click on the closed caption button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, then click on the show subtitles option. You can select a full page view of the captions by clicking on the link that's posted in the chat box below. This will open the captions in a separate browser for you to view. And those instructions also are posted in the chat for you as well. And before we fully get started, we can do some in the chat introductions, pretend that we're actually in real life. So if everyone could just uh, go to the chat and say your name, uh, if you're with an organization, the organization, totally fine if you're not, uh, and just the town you're in today, we can just get a sense of where folks are coming from around the state. And today we'll be talking about the Vermont Creative Network's key statewide advocacy priorities for the creative sector, and also getting an overview of what to expect in the coming legislative session. You'll be hearing from Representative Stephanie Jerome, a legislator who has been so supportive of the creative sector and instrumental in moving forward some of our most important priorities. You'll be hearing from me about our advocacy priorities and from Patty Comline, uh, Government Relations Manager at Downs Rackman Mar Martin, who will tell you a bit about an overview about what's to come in the legislature this season. Legislature this season. We'll take questions at the end of the presentation, but please feel free to put them in the chat as we go. Uh, we will kind of fold them in as we can into the conversation and then we'll save some time at the end so we can have a good discussion about where to go next. So I uh, was supposed to share my screen during all of that. So I'll start doing that now. And start the slideshow, I think. Ah, there we go. Um, and this was a wonderful graphic of the State House demonstrating the how our uh, tools of arts and culture are actually holding up the building as the pillars there. So we really love that one. So before we get started a bit about the Vermont Creative Network, the Creative Network is a collaborative statewide effort to bring together Vermont's creative sector, quantify its impact, and advocate for its growth into the future. Creativity is essential for the cultural and economic vitality of Vermont. The Vermont Creative Network facilitates advocacy, research, and networking for the creative sector. And who or what is the creative sector? Well, it's the enterprises, the organizations, and the individuals whose products and services are really rooted in artistic and creative content which in an amazingly creative state like ours is just a huge group of people. So the network's vision for Vermont is that arts, culture, and creativity are essential Vermont infrastructure, that Vermont communities thrive through creative expression and enterprise, and that creative enterprises succeed in a diverse, equitable, connected, and collaborative environment. So we'll be working to build that through our advocacy work this coming session. And before we talk about the year ahead, let's do a quick recap of last year, which is still this year, it's still 2023. <laughs> but the 2023 legislative session gaveled to a close on May 12th. And on June 20th, lawmakers voted to override the governor's veto of the state's $8.5 billion budget. And with so many newly elected lawmakers at the state house last session, the key priorities for the Vermont Creative Network were really building new relationships while also engaging veteran lawmakers about the power and importance of building and sustaining Vermont's creative sector. So thanks to all of your advocacy and support, we're happy to share a number of exciting successes from the 2023 session that we will be building on for 2024. First, there were increased appropriations for Vermont Humanities and the Vermont Arts Council, and a special appropriation for the Vermont Symphony Orchestra's statewide anniversary programming next year. There was broad support for these increases across the legislature, really demonstrating the role that the arts and culture are playing in statewide conversations about economic recovery and community revitalization. The legislature also and the governor also approved increased investments in public art and state buildings with Act 50. This legislation, which was introduced by uh, Representative Sarah Coffey and Butch Shaw, provided much needed updates to the Vermont Art and State Buildings Program. Most notably, a new funding mechanism that sets actually a minimum appropriation of $75,000, up from what used to be a maximum appropriation of $50,000. 
this is really great news. Uh, the program has not seen an increase since it was established in 1988. And since then, the program has commissioned over 60 artists to appear in 35 state-owned buildings and public spaces across Vermont, providing enjoyment and a sense of pride and a way to connect for all Vermonters. And we're thrilled with this new legislation to be able to do more of this meaningful work. We also hosted a Creative Sector Day at the State House, with Creative Sector folks testifying and numerous House committees to demonstrate the power of the arts and culture to transform lives, energize the economy, and sustain Vermont's vibrant cultural landscape. Representative Jerome, who you'll hear from in just a minute, read re Resolution HCR 28, supporting the state's creative economy. And finally, we continued to experience the impacts of cre the Creative Futures funding and shared that with the legislature. So the Creative Futures funding was a historic level of investment in Vermont's creative sector made during the 2022 legislative session to support the continued recovery and revitalization of Vermont's creative industries coming out of the COVID pandemic. And this was $9 million in American Rescue Plan Act funds that went to the Vermont Arts Council to create the Creative Futures Grant Program, which provided up to $200,000 in direct grants to creative sector nonprofits and for-profit businesses in their pandemic recovery. So last year, we shared with legislatures, legislators the ways in which these historic investments are helping creative enterprises rebound from the pandemic, build resiliency, and pave the way forward for a more vibrant and prosperous future for all of Vermont. So with all of those successes, we have so much to build on in 2024, and I'm looking forward to talking with everyone about how we're going to do that. So now I'd like to introduce my, one of my co-presenters, Patty Comline. Patty is a government relations manager at Downs Rackland Martin and represents the Vermont Creative Network as our lobbyist on behalf of the people working in the creative sector in our state. And on the on the behalf of the many artists and creatives who call Vermont home. Patty is a former Vermont legislator herself, and she has a deep knowledge of Vermont government, the state house, and she truly knows how things get done in our brave little state. So Patty, I will pass it over to you. Thank you. Thank you all for attending. And I was asked to present kind of a very high level view of what's going on in the legislature. And um, so we're gonna start by kicking this off. Go to the next screen, Susan. Thank you. So there's a lot of discussion that usually starts now and it builds, it ramps up. This is the end of a biennium. And so coming into a, an election year, uh, will Phil Scott run again? And nobody knows, I, I think probably including Phil Scott. He's got an incredible, Approval rating. The last time I saw it was about 81%. It's the most popular governor in this in the country. Um, so it's he's hard to beat. Uh, there is conversation now that Moreau Weinberger, the mayor of Burlington, is going to run um, against him. Uh, that would be a challenge. I it's um people said, well, it'll help him get his name out there. Uh, it will, but nobody would expect Moreau to win. Uh, but that opens up the mayor seat, the mayoral seat in Burlington, and um, Emma Mulvaney Sanek, who sits on House Commerce, uh, who uh, we are in House Commerce a lot, as you'll meet Stephanie uh, Jerome in a little bit, is also shares that committee with her, and so she will be running for mayor. If she were to win, it is expected that she would step down, and there, that would be an open seat in House Commerce. Uh, question of, is there going to be a challenge for Becca Ballant or Bernie Sanders? Um, that's interesting right now, given what's going on between Palestine and Israel. There's, you know, Becca Ballant is getting a lot of heat, um, both she and Bernie, uh, for their positions. They are, you know, they identify as being more left leaning. Um, well, they're definitely more left leaning. And, uh, and that would be the people who are more pro-Palestine and they haven't called for a ceasefire. They're calling for a pause. And that's been, has been a dust up for, for both of them. So I'm not sure if there'd be a challenge for, probably for Becca, that would be interesting. I don't know if anyone has seen um, what making the rounds is a, a clip of uh, Bernie Sanders mediating almost a fight between a uh, congressman who is a former wrestler, I guess, challenging somebody who's testifying to a throwdown. But if you haven't seen that, I would Google search it because Bernie running interference is pretty interesting. So the continued impact of the supermajority, this is a very um, left-leaning legislature uh, as a supermajority. The Republicans have a, a very small voice, not, not as impactful as they may have been in the past. Um, the issues that come up, I would say, are less economically focused and more social issues, and that will continue as the as the session goes on. 
Again, the era of federal money, that was Leahy money. He was a gift that kept on giving to Vermont, even in his in, in, the, in his last few things he did, actions were giving money out to the state. Uh, without him there, it's going to take a while for somebody to build up that, that time. Um, you know, we've got Peter Welch, who's great and very responsive to Vermonters' needs, but you really need the seniority there. And given Peter Welch's age, um, he's in great shape for his age, but he doesn't have the, the uh, what's the word, runway to continue to, to build up that kind of impact that Senator Leahy had. Um, so we're expecting that contraction, feel that contraction over time. Um, you can go to the next slide, Susan, because it feeds into this. And we could see it in the flood, um, the flood money that came in. We did get less support than we had after Irene. Granted, um, after Irene, there was more damage but not significantly more damage. And um, also things cost a lot more money now to um, to repair. So, so the money was tighter post uh, the recent flood. A lot of the discussion coming back is going to be about resiliency, about the recovery and how to build back better, build back stronger. That was discussion after Irene, but it's really driving home now, considering that Irene was only what, 11 years ago. Um, so there's a lot of conversations about how to um, mitigate and prepare for ongoing climate change uh, challenges that we have. Um, housing will continue to be a priority. Uh, it hasn't gotten a lot better. There was a big housing bill that was passed, um, but more work needs to be done on housing. Um, public safety is now rising. Uh, it's spreading. You know, we, we all know what's going on in Burlington. It's starting to happen in Rutland. Uh, public safety is a real concern, and I think that will be a major topic of conversation you know, starting in January, workforce development, of course, uh, we haven't solved the problems. It's 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 all integrated, right? You've got your housing challenges, your workforce challenges. I mean, if you had the housing, you'd have workforce. And uh, it's kind of like trying to, a Gordian knot, trying to figure out how to deal with all that. Paid family leave is interesting. Um, so that was left. They worked on uh, child care. And Susan, you can move to the next slide. These are, these are related. Um, I'm going to hop hop around, uh, I'm gonna go down a paid family leave. So last year, uh, work was done on childcare. Um, the paid family leave was kind of left. The House wants to continue work on paid family leave. I don't get the impression the Senate is as excited to pass a, a more comprehensive paid family leave than the governor has. Um, he's got a, a tiered down version. Um, and I think the Senate would like to beef up the governor's version of paid family leave. So there'll be conversations between the House and Senate on that. Again, the unfinished business was public safety. It's gone beyond, um, it's it's blended in public safety. I mean, everybody's aware of all of the, the deaths that have happened in the last month, month, month and a half. Um, the drug, the increase in drugs, the increase in organized uh, retail theft, uh, they're real concerns. What uh, I think Burlington tried to be very um, progressive in new reforms. And I think people are concerned that they may not be working. And so that will be revisited. Uh, there are real concerns about Burlington and Rutland, and, and it's spreading throughout the state. Um, again, the child care, uh, what was left last year, Let's Grow Kids did an incredible job advocating for uh, child care. There are some big reforms that are taking place. It's a slow start. They uh, had also wanted in the bill, in the law that passed, was that no more than 10% of your income will be paid for child care. I don't think that was included. They were talking about revisiting it this year and they're not sure. So Let's Grow Kids plan is to continue to educate the legislature on the ongoing need for, for affordable childcare. The Clean Heat Standard, I would need two hours and about five people to help explain this Clean Heat Standard. What this is doing is it's setting up a market to trade fossil fuel credits. And what this will do is there'll be a, kind of like a surcharge charge on your heating fuel that will go into a fund where uh, credits would go towards cleaner heat. Uh, this is the, the goal is to decrease our reliance on fossil fuels. The pushback on that is people with um, lower incomes may not be able to afford the heat pumps and, and, and um, the other clean heat alternatives. Uh, so these credits would hopefully help offset those expenses for people to transition over to electric alternatives. 
The biggest, I see one of the most imminent challenges we're facing and gut-wrenching challenges is the emergency housing. So last year, this is the hotel voucher program that started during COVID where it took uh, people that are unhomed into hotels. And last year, uh, so the program was set to end uh, July of 2023. Um, the governor didn't have a really great plan. There were at that point, I think about 1800 families in this hotel housing. And uh, what happened at the, and the legislature didn't, didn't really take steps on this. So what happened was the last day of the session when they're voting on the budget, the Republicans were all voting against the budget for their own reasons. And then there were a group of legislators who joined the Republicans to say, we're not gonna vote for the budget either unless you deal with this emergency housing. And uh, so it was said that the budget wouldn't pass unless this was addressed. So they did address it a bit. They found some more money and um, said that uh, 1,200 households would be able to continue to stay in the hotels through uh, up until April of 2024. It's now risen to 1,500 household uh, families are in hotels um, right now. It's costing, they've already invested $400 million in this program over the last three years. It would cost $70 million to continue. With, within those hotels, they don't have the support services uh, for families. So they've had a lot of problems in there. The neighbors have had a lot of problems. So this is a very uh, emergent, imminent problem um, that's I think is gonna receive a lot of attention and it's gonna cost a lot of money. Um, so I think I've finished, yes. I don't know if anyone has any questions, they can put them in the chat. I'm happy to have anyone contact me. And Susan, I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Thanks, Patty. Sure. Uh, it's going to be quite a session ahead. Lots of really big challenges that Vermont is facing and um, also some big opportunities as we are looking forward to how we're going to shape our state coming out of crisis after crisis after crisis. A lot of opportunities for what's next. So now I'm happy to introduce Representative Stephanie Jerome, who represents the wonderful town of Brandon and the Vermont legislature. Representative Jerome brings her diverse experiences working in nonprofits, for profits, and in the government sector organizations, as well as her experiences in, in community roles and local government to her role in the legislature, where she is the vice chair of the House Committee on Commerce and Economic Development. She's also an incredible champion of the creative sector in the State House. So thank you, Stephanie, for being here with us, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Susan. I'm really happy to be here. I, so I'm a third term legislator representing the town of Brandon, and um, I am uh, the vice chair of the Commerce Committee. I also serve on the UVM Board of Trustees as a legislative appointee, um, and as well as another myriad of other uh, committees and um, that we many of us serve on in the legislature. So uh, I guess I just want to sort of start off by saying like, I have firsthand um, experience in seeing the transformative effects of, of the arts on a small community. And Brandon certainly is a town that has benefited from um, its, its, uh, its dedication to the arts and the artists and the creatives and the artists and the performers and the musicians that all, all live here. And you know, in Brandon alone, we have many art galleries as well as um, a new uh, opera house and a local performing arts center. And so we, it has, over the past 20 years that I've lived in, or 20 plus years I've lived in Brandon, um, I've seen the uh, really solid impact of the arts in our town. So I, I am a um, strident and supporter of, of the arts. And one of the things I sort of wanted to mention this morning, uh, both Susan, Susan and Patty addressed some of this, but um, in Vermont, I think we're so lucky that we have a legislator that legislature that, um, despite we are, do have a supermajority, but um, of Democrats, but Republicans, Democrats, and progressives are all strong supporters of the arts. And I think uh, a few examples that Susan had 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 uh, brought up was uh, just I wanted to just highlight that the um, public art in state buildings bill was co-sponsored by Representative Sarah Coffey, who uh, is from is a Democrat, and Representative Butch Shaw, who's a Republican. So uh, I think that speaks highly of, of that program. And both of those folks are um, have vast experience in um, the capital budget and st funding state building. So uh, I think that's a, a big plus for the arts community. And then um, 
the other thing I wanted to mention was the uh, Creative Futures Act. So when I presented that on the floor of the house during sort of the depths of the of COVID and and sort of like, well, you know, I'm really hope that we get the support that we want and, and get the support we need. And um, I was just overjoyed to see that after my presentation, it was 100% support across the, the legislature. And, you know, these were trying times, still are trying times, but at that specific moment, they're try trying times and had, uh, there were so many needs and um, for legislative representatives in more uh, rural and more urban communities all saw the benefits of the arts in their uh, in their small towns and their large towns. And so to get 100% support was really just, um, I was I was overjoyed. And the, um, I guess the other last sort of point I wanna make was uh, about two summers ago, two, well, let's see, not two, yeah, I guess, well, a fall ago, um, I was on a, a committee to explore uh, film and creative media uh, with the idea that, you know, perhaps we would uh, create a film commission in the state of Vermont, which had been, uh, there had been two different iterations of that. That that whole project uh, started under Senator Randy Brock, a Republican from Franklin County. And um, he's a, an advocate for the arts as well. And so we uh, had a really super interesting uh, study um, over a number of months. I uh, was uh, coordinated through the Vermont Arts Council. And it was uh, really so interesting that um, I, I'll have to say that I, uh, to be perfectly honest, I totally changed my perspective on the need, need for this. And uh, I think it would, uh, we have some opportunity, I, I think, to maybe step forward um, and make some change in the state to embrace this uh, this industry, especially in light of the fact that um, so many folks have moved here over during the co during COVID and have made Vermont their permanent home, and then also the fact that all the colleges and all the universities and all the career technical education centers and perhaps many high schools have programs in film and media and digital arts and creative media, and so uh, I. As far as a uh, you know, looking forward for Vermont, we certainly want to be able to provide uh, employment opportunities, internships, apprenticeships to people who are studying uh, these fields um, in our state. Uh, so I guess that's sort of a, you know sort of wrapping it up. That I I just wanted to make sure that people understood that uh, that the legislature has a widespread support for the arts, uh, all sector, all types of the arts from uh, breweries and creative foods to uh, performing arts and music and 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 the whole wide gamut and venues. And, um, and just to know that uh, we're behind you. So thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Representative Jarrell. We so appreciate that and appreciate all of your leadership um, in moving the creative sector forward in our state. So if people do have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. We can um, kind of take them as we go or we'll get to them at the end. Uh, and now I'm going to get into specifically what we are going to be working on in 2024. So our broad creative sector advocacy goals in 2024 are twofold. The first is really working to position the creative sector as part of the solution to existing significant issues. So in addition to all of the great work that we do in funding the arts and supporting our economies, this year we'll also be working on partnering with some larger challenges that Vermont is facing and making sure that the arts are part of those, the arts and creative sector are part of those conversations. And we'll continue to celebrate and demonstrate the success and impact of Vermont Creative Futures funding. That funding was really at a level that had never happened in our state before, and we want to keep telling the stories of the impact of that funding because it's been so crucial, especially as we have found ourselves faced with another crisis this summer, knowing that we had that support allowed the entire creative sector to be able to weather whatever comes next, which hopefully will be a little break from crisis, but we'll be ready, whatever it is, because of that funding. So how are we going to be talking about this, and how are we going to make this case to our legislators? Well, it all comes down to the fact that arts, culture, and creativity are essential infrastructure that help solve existing significant issues in the state. First of all, the creative sector is key to economic development. 
In 2021, arts and culture contributed $1.1 billion to the Vermont economy, ranking a close third behind retail and construction when it comes to economic sectors. So that means that strengthening Vermont's creative economy will strengthen Vermont's overall economy. Second, the creative sector is tied closely to workforce development. All of Vermont's most promising jobs require creative, innovative thinking skills. Developing the creative sector's workforce will create more creative sector jobs that keep more Vermonters employed and living in the state. As Representative Jerome mentioned, we're, we have attracted a lot of people to the state in COVID and we have the capacity to attract a lot more. And people who are moving here say over and over again that they want to live in communities that are creative and have activities and lots to do and the creative sector is really key to that. And finally, the creative sector builds our communities. The creative sector is a crucial piece of Vermont's unique and desirable identity. It's what makes our community strong. It attracts tourists and new residents and it keeps people here. And it's what makes our state, state unique. Arts, culture, and creativity are essential to Vermont's recovery and resilience. So the Vermont Creative Network Steering Team and Advocacy Working Group used all of our collective knowledge and listened hard to the creative community in Vermont to align three specific legislative priorities that we will be working to advance in the coming session. The first is supporting and expanding state programs that benefit the creative sector. So we will be working with our partners in the Agency of Commerce and Community Development on two specific programs, the state designation programs and better places. So the Department of Housing and Community Development manages the state designation programs, which are, you may have heard them called designated downtowns or village centers, new town centers, growth centers, neighborhood development areas, these are programs that work together to provide incentives, align policies, and give communities the technical assistance needed to encourage new development and redevelopment in our compact designated areas that we want them. The program's incentives are for both public and private sector within these designated areas, including tax credits for historic building rehabilitation and code improvements, permitting benefits for new housing, funding for transportation-related public improvements, and priority considerations for other state programs. And the creative sector will be working to support updated regulations for these programs, ensuring that the creative sector is an integral part of all categories of designation. We know that the creative sector is key to responsible, sustainable development of our downtowns, village centers, and growth areas. And we fully support updating this crucial program that helps communities build and grow with the creative se sector integrated into their vision for the future. And we'll put a link in the chat for, with more information about that program. We'll also be working with the ACCD team to reauthorize the Better Places program with new sustained funding. And I saw that Richard is um, in this conversation, so please feel free to chime in, Richard, with more on this program. Uh, so Better Places is a community matching grant program that empowers Vermonters to create inclusive and vibrant public spaces, serving the designated areas that we just talked about. The program supports community-led projects that create, revitalize, or activate public spaces that bring people together to build welcoming and thriving communities across Vermont. So the way it works is the state contributes some funding, the projects crowdfund the rest, and then spaces across Vermont are turned into desirable places through intentional community development. And many previous projects in Better Places have been very successful creative sector projects, including community murals, public monuments, parks and outdoor recreation, and public art. So we'll be working with ACCD to support the legislature to dedicate new and ongoing funding to this very successful program. So coming out of this summer's devastating flooding that impacted the creative sector so severely, we'll also be working to increase state investments in climate adaptation and resilience for the creative sector in collaboration with investments in Vermont's downtowns. So as Patty mentioned, this will be a big topic in the legislature this year and as plans firm up around climate change adaptation and resilience, we will be advocating to include valuable programming like new funding for emergency preparedness for cultural organizations, increasing funding for grant programs that can support public art projects that are responsive to flood, flooding's impact on communities, and increased funding for the cultural facilities grant program to be responsive to climate adaptation projects. But our broader goal when it comes to climate change mitigation and resilience is to demonstrate that small investments in the creative sector have huge returns on climate resilience and building our communities. One great example of this is the Capital City Grange Hall in Berlin. They received a cultural facilities grant to put a new sump pump in their basement, which I will say is like the least glamorous grant project you can do. Uh, but this summer, they said that they had zero flooding. 
after having flooding every summer that they could remember. They have no flooding this summer. So we want to expand this model of small infrastructure investments that have a really huge payoff. And finally, as Representative Jerome mentioned, and coming out of last year's Vermont Film and Media Industry Task Force report, the Creative Network is advocating for a new film and creative media workforce development initiative in Vermont. We're requesting a targeted, thoughtful approach to supporting film and creative media that focuses on building the basic infrastructure that we know will make it easier to do this work in Vermont. Specifically, we're working to partner with Vermont Production Collaborative to create and maintain a centralized database of film and creative media professionals, equipment, venues, locations, and other resources. And also maintain a database of employment and internship opportunities that help retain Vermont's highly skilled film and creative media professionals who are here now and graduates who are coming out of our educational programs. We'll also be examining long-term sustainable proposals for uh, production incentives that will support existing Vermont-based film production and bring production projects to Vermont. We know that our state cannot compete with bigger states with more developed and supported film industries. We're looking at you, Georgia, New York, Massachusetts. But what we can do is create the systems and supports that build the film industry, a film industry that can thrive in Vermont. And that means thinking about what the future of film and creative media really looks like and thinking about how Vermont can position can position itself to be a leader in this new digital AI generated future of film and creative media. So we'll be working hard in the state house with our partners to tell the stories of the creative sector and pass all of this legislation or at least move it forward uh, that helps creates the conditions for creatives to thrive in Vermont. Because when the creative sector thrives, our economy thrives, our workforce thrives and our communities thrive. We'll also be supporting uh, the request of statewide arts and culture organizations and their appropriations, Vermont Humanities, the Arts Council, the Humanities, uh, the Vermont Historical Society, Vermont Symphony Orchestra, and the Governor's Institutes. And we'll be tracking important legislation on the most pressing issues and working to ensure that the creative sector always has a seat at the table when we're working to solve our biggest challenges as a state. So some dates for you to mark in your calendar because we'd love for you to be involved. Um, well, the first you're attending right now, so you're already participating. Thank you. Um, also to note that we have a lot of things coming up this session that we'd love people to be involved in. We'll be doing um, a creative sector ice cream social event at the legislature in February. Date on that is coming soon. February 7th, uh, Vermont Humanities is doing a farmer's night program at the legislature and the NEH chair, Shelley Lowe, is visiting Vermont that day, which is extremely exciting to have the attention of one of the federal um, cultural funding agencies on our state. February 14th, the Vermont Symphony Orchestra is doing their farmer's night program. And then on April 24th, uh, the creative sector will have an event in the card room. Uh, and also we'll be installing a new poet laureate this year in the legislature. So keep your eye out for more information about all of these events. So now that we've talked about what we're doing, what you can go to or be part of, we also wanna talk about exactly how you can participate because we need all of you advocating at every level to ensure that we are building the diverse, equitable, connected and collaborative environment we need for the creative sector to thrive. But how do we do that? Where do we begin? First, we want you to stay connected and to stay up to date on all of these advocacy priorities. If you haven't yet, you can sign up for the Vermont Creative Network emails, which is really the best way to follow along with us. There'll be a link in the chat for you to do that. Second, and really important, we need you to share your stories. Please reach out to any of us. We would love to know the creative sector successes and challenges that you're experiencing so that we can be better informed when we are representing the sector at the legislature. You can email me with any information or questions or stories or ideas. My email is also in the chat. And you should and can contact your elected representatives. The next link in the chat will help you find out who they are and where they're from. We are so lucky in Vermont that our elected officials are very approachable and they want to be connected. Please invite your legislators to visit you, to come to your programs, to see your gallery, to shop in your store, to shop local for their holiday gifts, uh, it's really the best way for them to see the creative sector in action. And that is both state representatives and also your local select board members, contacting them and letting them know that you're an important part of their local economy and their community. Everyone wants to hear that and be part of it. And while we've talked mostly about statewide advocacy today, I also want to mention that there's so much happening at the local level and many ways for you to get involved and to take your seat at the table. 
town plans, right? Vermont towns live and die by their town plans and they need to be updated every five years. And our creative network zone agents are working to better understand, to understand the best way to ensure that the creative sector is integrated into every town plan across the state. You can get involved by joining your town's town plan committee. There'll probably be information on your town website about that to have a voice in the process. And we can help you get connected with that too. Um, there's also a lot going on at local select boards. Select boards make decisions that have a direct impact on Vermont citizens every day. You can attend select board meetings. I promise they are usually much more interesting than the agendas make them out to be. And you can also run for office. We are so lucky to have several legislators who have worked in the creative sector advocating for these priorities from inside the state house and inside our local town select boards and city council. Running for office is at the state or local level is a great way to ensure that the voice and perspective of the creative sector is represented and there is no one better to do that than you. So I hope you are all fired up about the possibility and power of the creative sector. I know that I definitely am and I'm really looking forward to getting started in January when the session starts. So thank you all for being here and we'd be happy to take some questions from everyone or hear some comments or thoughts that you may have as we're heading into 2024. Okay. <laughs> um, Deirdre, do you wanna put Patty and, or yeah, great, back to, back to normal here. Um, Maybe we were just so comprehensive about how excited we are that there are no questions or comments, which is okay too. I can, oh, Patty, I saw you come off mute. Yes. Yeah, I would just like to add um, last year's legislative day for the creative economy, we had people in every committee talking about, it was, it was amazing. It was a scheduling challenge, but, but it was really impactful. So if any of you were there, I wanna thank you for that. You know, getting into every single committee in the state house really shows them how integral you are and important you are in every aspect of Vermont's every sector in Vermont. And so we're going to do that piece, that scheduling and testimony again next year. We're waiting. We're doing every other year when a new group of legislators come in. And so we hope you all think about participating in that. And um, and to Susan's point and Stephanie's point, your involvement makes all the difference. Uh, so thank you if you've done that before. If you haven't, uh, we talked right before you all came on. It's great to reach out to your legislators before we need something, and you know, make you know, introduce yourself to them so they know who you are. So next time they're doing something that may not be really great for you, it's it's a lot easier to have that conversation. So thank you. I, I may I just add something too, Susan. So I, 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 something that I like to do for my community is when I see grant opportunities come up, I like to be able to forward them on to um, the organizations that could benefit from them. And so I try to do that. And I think the best way to, to the first step in that is, is having, um, having a, a relationship with the folks who run those organizations. So, um, and, and often, you know, we always get so we all get so many emails and, and the arts organizations do as well. So um, it, we could just by forwarding those grant opportunities on that come through through our desks and um, it's helpful for everybody. So I guess that's just another reason to um, make sure you get to know your legislators. Thanks. And I know that members of our federal delegation are always supportive about writing letters of support. If you are applying for federal grants, that can be really helpful in the process as well. But again, it's great to have a relation, you know, have a relationship or know them or know who to contact in their office um, ahead of time too. And our office is all, always happy to help with that. Um, if you have questions or want to get get involved or get to know people. Well, I have a theater background, so I am very comfortable with the discomfort of waiting for questions. And I could wait here all day, but I don't want to put everyone on the spot like that. <laughs> um, so one last call for any questions or ideas or comments before we will um, let you go and start thinking about advocacy in your own areas. Okay, well, thank you so much, um, Representative Jerome. Oh, I'm gonna just, call out that Richard Amore just put uh, some information in the chat about Better Places where Richard is actually the person who manages the Better Places program and a great partner. So I don't wanna put you on the spot, Richard. I didn't know you're happy to see that you're here. Um, we're excited to be supporting that program this year. 
Thank you. It's nice to see you. Great presentation um, and what a partnership we have. So thanks for all your collaborations and advancement of the creative work across the state. Look forward to 2024. Well, thank you, Richard. We do too. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Representative Jerome. Thank you to Patty. Thank you all for coming. And uh, we look forward to being in contact and doing everything we can to move the creative sector forward uh, for all of us and for everyone in the state. So thanks so much for joining us today. Take care.